Hey everybody, and welcome to the very first lesson in our brand new series. I'm so excited about this study of Philippians. It's going to be awesome this fall. Uh, and uh, we're going to be starting in Philippians chapter 1. So I hope you have your Bible with you and I hope you have it open to Philippians chapter 1. Uh, also, there is a listening guide for this study for, uh, for today's, and so make sure you scroll down the same place you found this video. Click on that link, uh, download that listening guide, and print it out so that you can have some blanks to fill in. Uh, there are also some discussion questions there or some introspection questions for you. Uh, before we jump into this very first lesson of this brand new unit, though, let's pray, shall we? Father, your word tells us that joy is one of the fruits of your Spirit living in us. Um, your word tells us that as, as your spirit in us begins to change us and transform us, that one of, the, one of the qualities, one of the characteristics, one of the things that we will experience and that will be evident in our lives is joy. And so we so look forward, Lord, uh, over this next 12 weeks to opening your word and, uh, and allowing your spirit to reveal to us all the many different aspects of where that joy comes from and what it looks like, particularly uh, joy in the midst of a world that is as feeling as broken as ours is right now, Lord. Um, joy in the midst of a broken world just is exactly what we want to hear from you, Lord. And so uh, our gratitude to you is for your word and for um, the way it applies to every nook and cranny in every area of our life. And our promise to you, Father, is that, uh, that, that we will be faithful to opening your word together, that we will, um, that we will open our hearts as you, if you will also open our hearts, and that you'll change us. Uh, that's our prayer. Our desire is to be changed. We love you, Lord. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Spirit-filled joy in the midst of a broken world. Uh, what a timely unit, what a timely study this is going to be, and it's going to be a book study of uh, the letter that Paul wrote to the church in Philippi, the Philippian letter. We're just going to take it a little bit of time. We're going to get to cover every single verse uh, in this book, and I'm just excited about this. I love, love book studies. Uh, so let's talk about a little bit of background, first of all, uh, to this letter, to Paul's ministry, and to the Philippian church. Uh, interestingly, this study on joy was written by Paul from prison. Uh, he was in, under house arrest at the time of this. Uh, he, he had been arrested and was, was under house arrest with the Romans. Uh, and there are actually a few letters that he wrote from that place. But this one uh, particularly, though, really does hone in on and focus on uh, joy and this, this uh, 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 enviable quality in Paul uh, that allowed him to feel content in every circumstance, in all circumstances, no matter what, because of the Spirit's work in him. Uh, Acts chapter 16 is a great background read for you for this unit because that entire chapter tells the story of how this particular church that he's writing to, the church in Philippi, how it got started. Uh, it's, a, it's a really, really interesting uh, story, really interesting church. Uh, I have this uh, picture in my mind of Paul and Silas and probably Timothy uh, and probably Luke, probably uh, Dr. Luke, uh, the four of them kind of strolling into this very Roman colony, Philippi. This was a, a very Romanized, uh, nationalistic, patriotic, Roman patriotic colony. Uh, it, was a, it was kind of a hub of Roman activity. Uh, uh, one commentator I read uh, this week even said that it was also a favorite a retirement place for Roman soldiers. And so you can imagine the culture, a very patriotic uh, and nationalistic culture for the Roman Empire uh, in, that, in, that, uh, in that place. And so when Paul comes strolling into town with his entourage of guys and wants to begin talking about worshiping someone other than Caesar uh, and an entirely different way of seeing the world, uh, it's, it's really uh, impossible for us to imagine how difficult that would have been. There's not even a synagogue, apparently, there when he goes, because that was his tradition, was to go first to the synagogue and begin teaching there. There was apparently no synagogue there. Uh, so just a very secularized culture in that regard. Uh, and so he found a, a group of women uh, down at the river 
uh, who were who were praying together, uh, and one of them was a very prominent businesswoman named Lydia. And that group of women is the starting point for what became this church. Now, it would become a really eclectic church when you look at Romans at, at uh, Acts chapter 16, because not only did it have this very wealthy, prominent businesswoman in whose in whose home they probably met, the church probably met, but then you also have the story of the jailer who uh, came to the Lord after the miraculous work of the Holy Spirit to allow Paul and Silas to leave prison. Uh, that jailer came to God, he and his whole family, so they would have been members of this church. And then there's this other interesting story of the, of the girl who is possessed uh, and who is, is doing magical prophecies, and, and she's a slave, in, she's a slave girl, and the guys who own her are profiting uh, off of her ability to do this because of the demon that lives in her. And, and Paul casts out that demon. She probably, we think, became a believer and part of this church. So think about the eclectic nature of this church, a, a very wealthy, prominent businesswoman, uh, a, a Roman gladiator jailer, and then um, this, this girl, a former slave girl, uh, who had been possessed. Uh, that's the kind of church that he's writing to. It's just very, very interesting stories. Um, but this very eclectic congregation, very eclectic congregation. And Paul had um, apparently a very special relationship with this church. The kinds of things that we're about to see him saying to this church, we don't see him saying to any other congregations. Uh, Paul, as you know, was one who had a, was very, could be very direct and very blunt and had a way of pointing out um, the things that need to be fixed, the things that need to be changed, uh, the new directions that people need to go. Uh, you look at uh, some of his letters, particularly the letters to the Corinthians, how hard he was on them. This letter is just gushing with love and adoration, and there's an intimacy to Paul's relationship with the Philippian church that, that even goes beyond what we saw in his letter to the, Thessal to the church in Thessalonica. It's a, it's, a, it's a really interesting, uh, uh, intimate relationship that he has. And so uh, if you have your Bibles open to Philippians chapter 1, let's just start into this study on joy and see where it takes us. Uh, let's just begin with verse 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, uh, the, the, the ancient ways of writing letters always put the, the, the writer of the letter's name first rather than last, which makes so much sense to me if you think about that. Because the first thing that you and I do when we get a handwritten letter is we flip back to the back of it to see who wrote it. We want to know who it's from. So they put that right up front. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi. So to all of the believers, all of the believers in Philippi, with the overseers and deacons. And so he specifically mentions uh, specifically to the leaders of that church, the overseers and the deacons of that church. Verse 2, grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace. Grace and peace uh, was, became, had become a very common greeting for Paul. Not necessarily a common greeting in those particular words, the way they've been put together, because the truth is grace was actually a very common Greek greeting in the Greek culture. Peace, or shalom, was a very common greeting in the Jewish culture. And what Paul does, especially in these letters into Greek uh, communities, is he puts them together and says, grace and peace to you uh, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, for you all making my prayer with joy. Always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer it with joy. There's that word. That's the theme of our, path, of our entire unit. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the very first day until now. Let's stop there and recognize something that's a little bit um, extraordinary. And that is that in this really difficult culture that Paul strolled into, in order to present the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, into a un completely unreached people group. This is the first outreach into what you and I would call or know as um, uh, Eastern Europe. So the, the very first outreach with the gospel into a very difficult nationalistic Roman culture, and from the very first day that he began to teach there, there were 
uh, believers. There were believers that came to the Lord. There were people who received this message. It, 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 it's the work of the Holy Spirit in them even before Paul got there. And, and doesn't that dovetail perfectly in with what Pastor Chris is, uh, the, the vision that he is casting for us in our church? Uh, when we think, for example, about Luke chapter 9, the story of Zacchaeus, uh, how ready he was already because the Spirit was already at work in his life and his heart. How ready he was to see and to receive Jesus. Uh, when we think about the Ethiopian in uh, Acts chapter 8, how ready he was already in the Word of God reading it. How ready he was to receive Philip uh, when Philip came to talk to him. So it's a very similar situation here. It is clear, clear evidence that the work of the Spirit is already at play, is already involved, and is literally forging this friendship between Paul and the people of this church. It's, it's the difference. What, what I want to point out here is that when we think about finding joy, particularly in friendships and in relationships, think about this, what a huge difference it makes when Christ is at the center of those friendships or those relationships. That's not to say we can't find happiness and even healthy, healthy relationships with non-believers. It is to say, though, that joy, as opposed to happiness, which is dependent strictly on circumstances, joy, long-term, deep-seated, spiritual joy, comes when the Spirit of God is involved in that relationship. So if you have your listening guide, let's fill in the first blank on your listening guide. Doing life with friends who see the world just like I do brings comfort, maybe even happiness. But being in community forged by the Holy Spirit, even with friends very different from me, brings genuine joy. You see, what we see happening in terms of our friendships and relationships in this culture that is so divided ide ideologically is we see friendships typically being formed where they're easy to form, where everyone's like me, where everybody grew up like me, everyone looks like me, everyone thinks like me, everyone's worldview is the same as mine. It's easy to find happy moments with those kinds of friendships. But when the Spirit of God gets involved and when He begins to forge friendships with people who are nothing like me, like a slave girl who had been demon-possessed or a, a Roman jailer uh, or a wealthy businesswoman, when, when when, when God begins to forge friendships in that way with people who have very little, if anything, in common, and then they find uh, togetherness and community together, then there is a deep-seated joy that comes behind that. And that's what Paul is pointing out here. You guys are nothing like me. None of you, none of you are anything like me. And yet, I have this deep-seated joy because it is so evident that the Holy Spirit was involved from the very first day, from the very beginning of this friendship. Let's keep reading verse 6. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. I, this is one place where I actually love even more uh, the way the NASB says this. The NASB says, will perfect and it will perfect it until the day of Christ. The, 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 the nuance behind the way the NASB translates this in the English language is that it is this ongoing process, it's this perfecting process that is going on daily, moment by moment, day by day, working. And, and isn't that exactly what we described in our last study when we were looking at the work of the Holy Spirit? That's that sanctification process. The work of the Holy Spirit in me that is daily changing how I see things around me, changing how I understand the Word of God, changing how I see myself, how I see God, and how I see other people. This change process, transformation process, spiritual formation, sanctification, whatever word you want to use, that's this ongoing perfecting process. And what Paul is saying is, I find such joy in my relationship with you because that process is so evident. I see it. I know that, that, that the Holy Spirit began this relationship, began this transformation process in you, and will just continue doing it all the way up until Jesus comes back. And so that's a, a huge element, uh, a huge element. We, we have a role to play in one another's sanctification process. We were, 
We were designed as Christ followers. We were designed as human beings to live in community. And so we have a role to play in one another's sanctification process. These guys have played that role with one another. Paul has played that role in their life. They've played that role in his life. And that is an important component then of where real joy in a relationship comes from. Um, our Bible study, our prayer time, our time of tr our, our spiritual transformation process should involve friendships, relationships with other believers. And those friendships and relationships where we're seeing the, that transformation take place in one another's lives, we're actually walking through it together and experiencing it together. That's a, that's a big part of, of how God produces joy then through those very relationships. And, and let me just stop here and say, even if that process needs to happen over Zoom or teleconference or the phone, even in times like where we're living right now, where we don't have the privilege of sitting together most of the time and doing life together the way we'd like to be able to do it, our Bible studies with in person with each other or our, or our prayer time in person with each other, even though we can't do that, this, this relationship, this connection can still happen for us even if it has to be over a Zoom call or over the telephone, and needs to continue to happen for us because that is so much a part of what God uses to produce joy in our lives. If you have a listening guide, let's fill in the next blank on your listening guide. Now that we have learned that as Christ followers, we cannot go long without community with other believers, and we have learned that in the midst of this pandemic, haven't we? We really can't go very long without, without being together. Now that we've learned that we cannot go long without community with other believers, perhaps our next lesson is that meaningful community can happen in a variety of ways. And isn't that what we need to learn now? Isn't that where we need to, to, to grasp God has been taking us? There's a way we can connect with one another. There are varieties of ways. A variety of ways that we can connect with one another and we need to find those ways and take it to take advantage of that in order to be a part of one another's spiritual transformation spiritual formation process all right there's more though about Paul's just love for these people look what he says next it's just such a beautiful beautiful words from him verse 7 it is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. What Paul's saying to them is, this life has been hard on us. It's been hard on me and it's been hard on you but we've walked through this together and experienced God's grace together even in the midst of this. And just to kind of give some perspective on this, let me remind you of what Paul says in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 11 about his own hardships because these people, these friends in Philippi were with him either in person, in some cases, some of them, or at least in prayer spiritually with him in the midst of what he's about to describe. This is from 2 Corinthians chapter 11 beginning in verse 24. He says, Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, dangerous, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless, sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Those are Paul's own words. Uh, at one point in his ministry where he was just kind of reflecting back in that case for the, for the people in Corinth uh, to, to say to them, I know this life is hard. Look at what I've gone through. And, and what he's saying now to the people in Philippi is, you guys have been right there with me in the midst of all of this. It's been hard for you too. Some of you can say some of these same things. This has been a difficult life, but we've walked it together and we've experienced these hardships together. 
They shared a mission with him, but they also shared the pain and the suffering with him. They shared the severance with him. They shared God's grace with him and God's deliverance with him. In fact, he, it was from one of their own jails, a Philippian jail, that the Spirit of God delivered him, and they got to experience that with him. Uh, and so the, the, life that, the life that we are called to live in, the life that we are called to walk in this very, very broken world, is about anything but happiness. It's not, it's not about comfort and happiness, but it is about joy. And one of the ways we find joy in the community that God has called us to walk with is when we walk together through these kinds of struggles and these kinds of hardships. It is foundational. It is a foundational component to the joy that God can bring in a relationship and in community. If you have your listening guide, Let's fill in the next blank on your listening guide. This is the third statement. Many and cheap are the friendships that bring us happiness. But relationships that produce genuine joy are those with whom we have walked through pain and hardships and together found spiritual significance. Spiritual significance. And so, in other words, we walk together through difficult times, and then together we ask the questions, what is God doing? What is God saying? And how is He shaping each of us as a result of these struggles? And we're, we're having those kinds of gospel-centered, spirit-filled conversations with one another. We're a part of what's going on spiritually in one another's lives. That's where this deep-seated, long-term joy that God brings through community, Christian community, into our lives comes from. And so look, uh, as we wrap this up, then look how Paul prays for them beginning in verse 9. Here's what he says. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless, blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory of and praise of God. I love the way Paul talks about, my prayer for you is just that you'll love well and that the love that the Spirit produces in you will just blossom and bloom and, and produce more and more fruit, that you'll love more and more. But listen to the way Paul talks about that love and with knowledge and discernment. One of the things I love about Paul's writing is that he usually, he often he often couples love, the notion of love, with the notion of truth or knowledge or discernment. Uh, for Paul, they almost are two sides to the same coin. Uh, you, you don't have one without the other. Remember the way he said it in, in Ephesians chapter 4. He said, speaking the truth in love. That was a big part of his unity uh, advice to the church. How to be unified as a church is speaking the truth in love. He couples those two things together, truth and love, knowledge and love, discernment and love. They go together for Paul as two sides of the same coin. Um, it, it has been in, in, in this divisive culture that you and I are living in, that we've been in for at least a decade now, maybe more, in this divisive culture where we feel like even some of our Christian friends are drifting further and further away from us ideologically, and it's difficult for us to know how to have hard conversations with them. One of the questions that the Lord has kept drawing me to for some years now is, in this circumstance, in this relationship, in this conversation that I'm about to have, what does love look like? I think that's an important question. When Paul says to them, I'm just praying that the love that the Spirit produces in you will abound more and more, that's what's going on, is I'm asking myself that question, what does love, real love, what does real love look like? Because real love isn't always comfortable. It isn't always happy. Sometimes there are hard things, hard truths that have to be said. And in fact, I believe that the Apostle Paul would say, there's no such thing as real love that is devoid of truth where you're not speaking the truth to one another. If you can't speak truth to one another, it's not love. And so at the same time though, I think that sometimes we speak truth in a way that is hurtful or harmful and not intended to, not, there's no love behind it at all. And so truth without love is just as dangerous as love without truth. 
In fact, there's really no such thing as real gospel-centered truth without love, and there's really no such thing as Christ-centered love without truth. Joy, joy then comes out of these friendships where those two things are married together. Truth and love. Love and truth are two sides of the same coin in this relationship, and there's always going to be both together, not one without the other. That's where, that's where real long-term joy begins to bubble up out of a relationship. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the last blank then on your listening guide. To the Christ follower, love and truth are inseparable, inseparable. One without the other is worthless, even meaningless. Friendships that produce long-term joy are ones where both truth and love are abounding more and more. And so this particular lesson, as Paul begins this letter to his beloved church, the Philippian church, this particular, this particular lesson is saying to us, long-term spiritual joy that the Spirit produces in us, one of the places we find that joy is in the relationships that we have with other believers. And we find it because of the Spirit's presence there from the very, very beginning, we find that the Spirit is the one who forged us together. You may have Christian friends who are nothing like you. And if that's true, that's some evidence that maybe the Spirit, it, we would never have found each other, but for the Spirit of God, isn't that something to rejoice over, right? And so the Spirit is there from the beginning. The Spirit is, is walking us through struggles together, and we're coming out on the other side of those struggles, having walked together, and that's a part of our joy as well. Uh, the Spirit is, is helping us be a part of each other's spiritual transformation process. We're having those kinds of conversations with one another as we open God's Word together, as we pray together. And our love, we're watching our love grow more and more, but it's always a love that is coupled with truth, with knowledge, with discernment. When we start looking for joy in the midst of a broken world, as Christ followers, the first place we should be looking is in the relationships that God has given us and what, what's going on in those relationships. That is a huge source of joy for us, but there's more to come. And we'll be back here in Philippians chapter 1 next week. I hope your week goes great. God bless you, and I'll look for you here again next week. Take care.